So far we have said that when enzyme linked receptors bind their ligand, there is a conformational change. These two receptors come together and because of that conformational change, the two kinase domains of these receptors, they become, they cross phosphorylate each other. They have weak kinase activity. When they are phosphorylated, their kinase activity enhances and they phosphorylate the receptor at other additional locations that creates more phosphate domains and what happens with these phosphate domains let's see that when these phosphate domains are generated by these enzymes it creates basically docking sites where specific proteins can bind which are present in the cytoplasm these docking domains these phosphorylation sites outside the kinase domain have their high affinity docking sites. This phosphorylation results in binding of other proteins that can interact with these domains. Some of these proteins are for example phospholipase C. We have already talked about this protein what it does when we were talking about G protein coupled receptors. This is similar protein it is a different version of it but it does basically the same thing it generates a molecule of inositol phosphate which results in increase of calcium ion concentration in the cytoplasm and it generates diacetylglycerol in the plasma membrane where that phosphatidyl inositol has been cleaved it also is a docking site for phosphatidyl inositol 3 kinase this is an enzyme which can basically add phosphate groups to phosphatidyl inositol. As you will see later that when this phosphorylation occurs, it generates docking sites on the plasma membrane for other proteins which have enzymatic activity. So here we have basically a basic structure, generic structure of a receptor tyrosine kinase. You can see the kinase domain here which has been split and other additional residues which or amino acids which have which are present in this protein which can be phosphorylated as i said when these receptors are activated add phosphate groups other proteins are attracted one of them as i mentioned is phosphatidyl inositol kinase this protein when it is recruited at the site of enzyme near the plasma membrane it adds a phosphate group to phosphatidyl inositol when this happens this molecule which is embedded in the plasma membrane this molecule serves as a docking site for other proteins additionally it can also be cleaved at this region which we have, which we are seeing here when it is cleaved part of this molecule can go and bind the calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum resulting in the increase of calcium ion concentration in the plasma membrane and diacylglycerol as you know the hydrophobic molecule stays embedded in the plasma membrane so other than those two molecules that we have talked about a very important molecule can also bind receptor tyrosine kinases this molecule is also like a G protein but has is slightly different this is called RAS. This protein does not bind the receptors directly. This protein functions like the G protein we have talked about earlier. And when it is bound to GDP, it is inactive. When it is bound to GTP, it is active. How does this protein get activated since it cannot bind the receptor? This receptor, the docking sites we talked about, recruit adapter proteins these adapter protein in this case for example GERB2 is the adapter protein it will bind this receptor when this binding occurs there's a conformational change in GERB2 which allows another molecule which is in some literature is called SOS or also RAS-JEF when this molecule RAS-JEF or SOS binds this complex now it is in close vicinity of RAS near the plasma membrane where RAS lives. Like G protein, this RAS also has a hydrophobic domain 
it's covalently linked to a hydrophobic molecule that allows it to be attached to the under surface of the plasma membrane. RAS Jeff activates RAS. Now when the RAS is activated, it can do several things. We will talk about that later. But here I would also like to mention, we have already said that this sort of signaling basically results in cell proliferation, cell division or survival. It's pertinent to mention that RAS is mutated in 30% of human tumors or human cancers because these signals are telling cells to divide. And it is these type of signals, uncontrolled cell division is basically cancer. So let's talk a little more about RAS because it's a very important protein. Results, as I mentioned, any mutation in it can result in uh, cancer. So RAS is a switch which has two positions on and off when it is bound to GTP it is in on state when it is bound to GDP it is in off state now G protein does not really need that much help it can exchange GDP for a GTP pretty much on its own for the sake of simplicity that's the version we are going to follow but here RAS is actually smaller protein than G protein it needs additional help the help comes from GEF, which basically abbreviation for guanine exchange factor. So this molecule, GEF, allows RAS to get rid of GDP. And because, as I've mentioned, GTP concentration is greater, the probability is RAS will bind a GTP molecule now and not GDP. Like all signaling molecules, it is very important that we turn them off. G protein can hydrolyze GTP into GDP and become inactive. RAS does not have that ability. RAS needs help from another molecule called GAP to hydrolyze GTP into GDP so the switch is in back and off state. GAP basically stands for GTPase activating protein that causes RAS, that enhances RAS's intrinsic GTPase activity and causes it to hydrolyze GTP into GDP and become inactive. So RAS can exist in off and on state just like a switch. How does RAS manifest its, its effects in the, it can communicates this information that is, that it is in active state or inactive state? And how do we know that SOS or GURB2 interact with each other? We will look at that in the next module.